People need to know about a species in order to act on behalf of that species and protect their habitat. Polar Bears International is uniquely poised to connect people to polar bears in the Arctic. The Tender Connections program allows us to connect scientists with viewers around the globe. And the goal of outreach like this is to instill hope and inspire action in our viewers. We have a mobile broadcast studio, and we reach out to classrooms all over the world to talk about polar bears in the western Hudson Bay. We have a couple different kinds of connections that we do out here. Sometimes it's live back and forth, and other times the live connection goes out and questions are chatted back for us to answer. Will polar bears go extinct? What can my class do to help protect sea ice? Just the other day, we had a Skype chat with an entire school in Kiev, and we got to show them their very first polar bear. And, and when that comes up on the screen, it's really cool. It's neat to maybe inspire the next generation of scientists. Seeing their faces light up when we show them videos and photos and talk about our research gives us motivation to keep going and keep doing what we're doing. Join us as we stream live. You can view the broadcast on our website or watch live chats on social media. Tune in, ask questions, join our efforts to protect polar bears and the sea ice they depend on.
People need to know about a species in order to act on behalf of that species and protect their habitat. Polar Bears International is uniquely poised to connect people to polar bears in the Arctic. The Tender Connections program allows us to connect scientists with viewers around the globe. And the goal of outreach like this is to instill hope and inspire action in our viewers. We have a mobile broadcast studio, and we reach out to classrooms all over the world to talk about polar bears in the western Hudson Bay. We have a couple different kinds of connections that we do out here. Sometimes it's live back and forth, and other times the live connection goes out and questions are chatted back for us to answer. Will polar bears go extinct? What can my class do to help protect sea ice? Just the other day, we had a Skype chat with an entire school in Kiev, and we got to show them their very first polar bear. And, and when that comes up on the screen, it's really cool. It's neat to maybe inspire the next generation of scientists. Seeing their faces light up when we show them videos and photos and talk about our research gives us motivation to keep going and keep doing what we're doing. Join us as we stream live. You can view the broadcast on our website or watch live chats on social media. Tune in, ask questions, join our efforts to protect polar bears and the sea ice they depend on.
In a remote corner of the Alaska Peninsula, brown bears at Brooks River in Katmai National Park are currently making their final preparations for winter hibernation. At nearly the same latitude, only more than 3,000 kilometers east, polar bears wait on the shore of Hudson Bay for the return of sea ice. Unlike the brown bears who are, who are at their fattest point of the year, polar bears are at their skinniest. Polar bears and brown bears are closely related species, and they have a lot in common, but many aspects of their lifestyles and adaptations contrast sharply. Their habits and habitats also raise questions about their future in an era of human-driven climate change. As winter descends upon North America, we witness a tale of two ecosystems and the bears that call these places home, and I'm happy to share these places with everybody around the world. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with explore.org. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Elisa McCall. She is the Director of Conservation Outreach and a staff scientist at Polar Bears International. Elisa is here to help us compare and contrast the amazing lives and adaptations of brown and polar bears. Elisa, it's great to have you along with the ride today, and I'm really excited for polar bear season to be launching. We fall, I think we saw our first polar bear on the cameras today. Yeah, the cams are just starting to go live today. So exciting to see a polar bear and exciting to chat with you again, Mike. I love our now annual baton pass of the brown bears over to the polar bear cam. Yeah, this is always a fun chat to do. And I know I always uh, uh, learn a lot about how different polar bears are from brown bears, even though they are very closely related to one another. So we're going to try to discuss different adaptations of the bears. We're going to talk about their different habits and habitats. Uh, we're going to talk about how you know the effects of climate change can influence um, the health and survival of these different species. And we want to try to answer your questions as well. So if you're watching at school or at home, wherever you happen to be right now, if you can drop uh, questions into the chats, we'll do our best to try and answer a few of those during the broadcast today. Uh, Lisa, though, I think uh, since this is like you know the launch of polar bear season, tell us a little bit more about Polar Bears International and its mission. Great. So Polar Bears International, we are a nonprofit organization, and we are the only organization in the world that is solely focused on conserving wild polar bears. We want to see polar bears roaming the Arctic for many generations to come. And so we work to do this through a mix of research, both our own and supporting other research through education, media and advocacy. And so that really involves speaking to folks here today. And right now, our team, many of our team, are in Churchill, Manitoba for the kickoff of polar bear season. And as I mentioned earlier, Katmai National Park, and uh, it, which is in Alaska and Churchill, Manitoba, are located at nearly the same latitude. Both are uh, located a little above 58 degrees north of Earth's equator. Yet these places harbor much different habitats and they provide bears with uh, the opportunity to survive in different ways. So let's uh, first start with Katmai, because that's the place that I'm most familiar with when we're talking about brown bears. Uh, Katmai has plenty of tundra and gl glaciers at high elevations, and the region experiences a, a relatively temperate environment due to the warming effect of the nearby Pacific Ocean, which is to the east and south of the national park, and also the warming effects of the Bering Sea, which is to the west. So it's kind of snugged right in between two big uh, major ocean water bodies. And then the lowland habitats of this area are thick with small trees and uh, tall shrubs. The landscape is also rich with an interconnected system of rivers and lakes. And this creates perfect habitat for salmon, especially sockeye salmon. In Katmai, uh, the central portion of the National Park where Brooks River is located, salmon are the most abundant high calorie food for brown bears. And this allows bears in Katmai to live at very high densities. More than any, or excuse me, more than 80 individual brown bears have been identified along the three kilometer long Brooks River in summer per year. So that's an average per year over the last 20 uh, plus years. Uh, so in Katmai, bears are found virtually everywhere, but they're especially concentrated along salmon streams. Uh, Elisa, can you introduce us to uh, the Churchill region in the Western Hudson Bay area? How does that habitat differ from what we see at Katmai? Absolutely. I love how you said a tale of two ecosystems. There truly are so many differences uh, that viewers will get to see. 
So first of all, right now the polar bears are on land. And of course this is kind of unusual for a polar bear. They would much rather be out on the Arctic sea ice, which is their main habitat and which is where they hunt seals for food. Of course, we're seeing these bears on land right now because you know we just got past summer and there's no sea ice in this region in the summer. So this is called the seasonal sea ice ecoregion, which means that the Hudson Bay body of water completely freezes over in the winter, all the bears are out hunting. And then in the summer, it completely melts and all the bears are forced onto shore. Now they've adapted to do this for months on end, so they can live on shore and not eat much for months. But what we're seeing right now is this gathering of the bears. As the temperatures get colder, it gets darker, the bears know the ice will be back soon and they start moving toward the coast, getting ready for hunting season, basically. So we know that, they know that. So we are able to go out there with cameras and with Tundra Buggy One and other Tundra Buggies uh, for tourists to come see as well. And we can roam around these known set areas and look for polar bears at this time of the year and pretty guaranteed to see them most of the time at this time of year. The bears will be here until maybe mid, late November, maybe December, depending on when the ice freezes up. And then we won't see them again until next spring or summer. Now this is a really special ecosystem. Uh, the Hudson Bay area and particularly Churchill is quite unique, not only for polar bears, but for a lot of species. And that's partly because this region is um, an overlap area of multiple ecosystems. So we have the marine ecosystem, of course, but we also have the tundra, we have boreal forest. And so we have a lot of different animals, creatures, things we might see on the cams at this time of the year. It's a very special place for birding. Birders kind of flock here with the birds sometimes. Uh, but of course, our number one attraction is the polar bear. So it's quite a unique spot. And again, at this time of year, the bears aren't eating a lot. So that's quite different than the brown bears in Katmai who are kind of gorging themselves on the cams. We kind of watch polar bears sleep a lot. Maybe they're gonna eat some kelp for you. Uh, we'll see what they get up to, but they're uh, a little less active potentially, but still amazing to watch. Yeah, it's it's a stark contrast between the two different places. I remember uh, several years ago when I visited Churchill, just how different the landscape was compared to Katmai, because you are so far removed from sort of like the influences of like a, a warm warmer body of water like uh, the Pacific Ocean. And along with the differences in habitat, polar bears and brown bears are also different in their adaptations. And you can recall from biology classes that an adaptation is a behavior or a trait that makes an organism better suited for its environment. And while brown bears and polar bears are closer, close to the related species, they display considerable differences in, in appearance, in diet, uh, as well as maybe the places that they live. So let's discuss Oh, you know, maybe what defines these two bear species, starting with their appearance. And I think for most people, obviously, the first thing that you see when you see a brown bear is the color brown. <laughs> and brown bears are aptly named. Their <laughs> fur is often plain brown, but it ranges anywhere from blonde to dark brown and virtually anything in between. And while it often provides some camouflage, the fur is really not specialized for its uh, habitat, for the habitats that brown bears live. As I understand it, though, for uh, excuse me, uh, Elisa, it uh, the polar the, the fur of polar bears is much more specialized for an Arctic environment. Absolutely. So polar bears are highly specialized overall, and their fur is one great example. So their fur is not actually white; it's transparent and hollow. So it, it looks white to our eyes in the way that it reflects light, and the hollowness helps trap warm air against their bodies. They also have two layers of fur. They have a very thick under layer close to their skin that you can imagine being like a woolly sweater. And then over top, they have a thick layer of more like guard hairs. So that's almost like they're wearing a rain jacket over top of that. So between the two layers, the hollow fur and the clear fur, they really do have special, special fur for their Arctic environment. And all bears are classified in the order carnivora. That is that they're the same group of mammals, or that is a group of mammals that includes uh, canines, felines, raccoons, seals, weasels, and a few other different uh, families all kind of lumped together. And it seems to make intuitive sense that, that bears are considered taxonomic carn carnivores because they have big teeth. And except for you know giant pandas, they eat a lot of meat when given the chance. But the classification isn't based exclusively on diet. Rather, it is based on 
a shared evolutionary history. So just because you're in the order carnivora doesn't mean an animal must eat like a carnivore. And this is one of the most notable differences between brown and polar bears is diet. Uh, brown bears, uh, to give everyone a basic introduction to them, they live as generalist omnivores. They're, they are like humans in that sense. They will eat and can survive on a great diversity of foods. In fact, most brown bear populations in North America, Asia, and Europe are largely vegetarian. In the Northern Rocky Mountains, for instance, the yearly diet of many grizzly bears is more than 90% plant-based. Um, and there was actually somebody who was wondering what's the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear. We had a question about that real quick. Same species, um, their scientific name is Ursus arctos. Really just depends on where in North America you're talking about the animal. So if you see uh, Ursus arctos like in the Rocky Mountains, that's a grizzly bear. Most people are gonna refer to them as that. Um, even in uh, the Wapusk National Park or Churchill area, you know, generally grizzly bears, a few of them might wander in or have recently. But if you're along the coast of British Columbia or Alaska, usually people are considering those brown bears. They have access to more coastal resources and they grow a little bit larger, but the same, uh, the same species. Uh, and cat mice bears though, they're a bit different uh, because they have access to a lot of meat, particularly salmon, but they sh don't shun plants either. They eat a lot of grass, they eat a lot of sedge, herbaceous plants, and of course berries. And they're adapted to survive on that roughage, I think better than a lot of other carnivores because they don't have, uh, even, even though they don't have a multi-chambered stomach or other specialized organs to help them digest plant matter, they have a slightly elongated digestive tract compared to like a wolf or like a lynx. And that helps them pull nutrition out of plants. Uh, in, in contrast, Elisa, though, I think this is one of the major differences between brown bears mm -hmm. and, and polar bears is that uh, polar bears seem to be, again, specialists for, uh, for a specialized diet. Absolutely. They are considered the most carnivorous of all bears. Um, now, you can take that to mean they eat the most meat, but really they eat the most fat or blubber of all bears. So we kind of like to call them lipovores, even though that's not really a thing. Um, but polar bears really are looking for an animal-based diet. And when there's times of good eating, we will see polar bears go out, hunt a seal and strip the blubber off, eat all the blubber. They can eat you know, 100 pounds of blubber in one sitting and move on. And they might even leave the meat behind for the Arctic foxes and birds and other scavengers. So really, if a polar bear had its choice, it would focus on a blubber diet. Now, of course, they are technically omnivores. They can eat other things. And viewers of the camp, like I mentioned earlier, you will see some polar bears having a seaweed salad this fall. We've watched them eat uh, voles and little mice on the cams. They'll scavenge on what they can. They're bears, and they're hungry all the time. But truly, they want to be eating blubber, and that's what's best for them, and that's what they're adapted to do. Polar bears process blubber exceedingly well. It's well over 80% of the blubber that polar bears eat goes directly onto their body in the form of body fat. They're highly efficient. It's a really good thing people aren't so efficient at converting fat like that, uh, but they are much less efficient at processing carbohydrates and proteins compared to brown bears. So if you were to give a polar bear only a protein and carbohydrate diet, that polar bear would not be at its healthiest. It might even get sick over time because their bodies really look to fat to process the most. So they really are fat specialists. I was also reading too uh, recently, I can't remember where I read this, Elisa, but uh, some zoos are paying attention to that now because they thought of polar bears as like, again, carnivorous animals. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so if you give them a big hunk of meat, they'd be fine with that. But it seems like we're learning a lot more that they, they need more, much more than just protein in their diet. It seems like that fat is is what they need is am i correct in that, in that assumption yeah mike thanks for bringing that up that's absolutely true so there's been some really great research out of zoos looking at the long-term impacts of zoo-based diets on polar bears and you're right the conclusion was that the food that polar bears need to consume uh, particularly you know bears might get a, a kibble form amongst many other uh, yummy treats but that we could do a better job of making the diet that they're fed much more high in fat and much lower in protein too much protein is harder on their kidneys so they really do need that fat and zoos are making that change to make the bears the healthiest they can be well, let's talk about the teeth of these uh, these different animals we see that specialization or generalization in the case of brown bears when we look at uh, teeth 
uh, brown bears, for example, that you know they have big canine teeth. They have somewhat sharpened carnassial teeth that help them shear meat from bone, but they also have slightly flattened molars to help them uh, chew vegetation. And this is also again a, a clue to the to the diet of the animal itself because we're seeing brown bears have teeth that are better adapted to handle a wide variety of foods. Uh, so how is how are polar bear teeth differing from brown bears, and, and what clues does that tell us about their diet, Elisa? Right, they have just true carnivore teeth. So of course, really really sharp front teeth incisors and they do have molars in the back that are flatter but their molars are overall sharper than the brown bears and they're going to be more for shearing that blubber shearing into seals um they're canines for fighting into seals they have a diastema so a a gap between their front teeth and their back teeth that's just you know the perfect size for a seal head um they also have a little um, incisor behind their canine at the bottom, it's vestigial. That means it's left over from the brown, when they were brown bears, you know, so they don't really need that little tooth. So scientists for many years have been using that tooth. We can pop it and cut it in half and it's got rings just like a tree because polar bears go through this feasting and fasting cycle. Their teeth can grow in rings like trees, feasting and fasting in the winter and summer. And so we can count the rings to see how old a polar bear is, but with advances in genetic technology, we're getting now to the point where we can simply take a small blood sample and check their blood and find out how old they are instead of having to pop a tooth. So they don't need the tooth, but you know, if you don't have to pop one, why do it? So that's pretty cool. But ultimately overall, they do have much sharper teeth than brown bears. And I think one interesting thing about their mouth as well is that they have slightly weaker jaws than brown bears because oh, their prey is squishier. Yeah, brown bears are doing way more grinding. They need a bigger bite strength than polar bears do. So a little bit weaker of a bite. Still, no one wants to be bit by a polar bear, but not quite as bad as a brown bear. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the differences in habitat between, you know, Katmai and the Churchill region, but I want to try to broaden uh, our discussion of habitats for brown bears and polar bears overall, because, you know, we, we know that there's physiological and physical differences that exist between these bears and it's visible in their fur color. It's, um, it's visible in the shape of their teeth. It's also, you know, influenced uh, their evolution of their digestive tract, uh, but habitat does that as well. So when we consider where brown bears make a living, then we find that they are not highly specialized for living in any one particular type of habitat. Brown bears occupy a diverse a number of terrestrial habitats. Prior to U European colonization, if we just focus on North America, brown bears lived everywhere from Arctic tundra to coastal California, to the mid continental prairies, to the deserts of what we now call the Southwest US and Northern Mexico. And one way that a brown bear uh, in, is adapted to living in a variety of places is by the shape of their claws. Although brown bears can climb trees, their claws aren't w really well suited for climbing. Instead, their front claws are several inches long and they're adapted to act as excavators. They're like shovels. This helps them to dig up tubers, roots, underground truffles, ground squirrels, bees nests, even clams. And clams is a foraging opportunity that uh, some bears on Katmai's Pacific Coast will, will seek every summer. So brown bear claws, they're like an all-purpose tool for getting at foods that reside under the surface of the soil. Elisa, um, you know, when I have looked at polar bear feet like on the cameras or just like a photo of them. I'm always like really amazed by the size of polar bear feet and the shape of their claws. Uh, so how do polar bear claws uh, differ from brown bear claws? And what does that say about their preferred habitat? Right, again, we have an example of polar bears having highly specialized claws. And if you could take a moment to imagine what might be the best claw shape for grabbing a slippery, wriggly seal. That's what polar bears have. So compared to the, so the brown bear there on the left, long, like you said, for digging, polar bears, very thick, shorter, and extremely sharp and strong. So these are great claws for grabbing those seals and hauling them out of the ocean. They also add maybe a little bit of traction on the slippery sea ice. So it's really the polar bear's foot pad that has little sticky papillae, we call it. Uh, that give them more grip on the ice and actually winter tire companies have used the polar bear paw as a model to improve their winter tires but for the claws thicker sharper maybe a little stronger 
And, you know, one of the biggest differences between brown and polar bears, too, becomes apparent during winter. Uh, for brown bears, winter is a season of hibernation. And that's the event that brown bears in Katmai National Park have been preparing for for months, really, since uh, since uh, June and July. They've been trying to gain back the fat reserves that allow them to survive winter hibernation. And in Katmai, brown bears, they're, they hibernate in dens excavated on steep well-vegetated slopes that collect and hold a lot of snow. The steep hillsides allow bears to dig horizontally rather than downward, which lessens their workload. The roots uh, from vegetation in the soil help stabilize the den structure. Well-drained soils reduce the chance of water seeping into the den during, during warm uh, winter weather. And then the snow on the outside uh, insulates the den against cold winter weather. For me, though, it's really the experience of a bear inside of the den that is most fascinating. Uh, they survive using some of the most remarkable adaptations of any mammal. While hibernating, bear, uh, brown bears do not eat, drink, urinate, or defecate. They're surviving on body fat alone, and that's why they've been working so hard to gain body mass throughout the summer. By burning fat, bears get the energy they need to stay warm. Uh, and they also produce metabolic water, so that helps to keep them hydrated, even though they're not drinking water. They also do not experience significant bone or muscle loss, dis despite a complete lack of exercise. That amount of continuous bed rest in a person would result in severe negative con consequences for uh, that person's health. But brown bears, you know, even though they're not exercising, they have a, a very slow heartbeat at that time of the year, they can even heal wounds while they're hibernating. On top of all that, mother brown bears give birth to cubs in midwinter, right around the end of January or early February. After cubs are born, they'll suckle on mother's milk for several weeks in the den before family uh, leaves the den in spring. And uh, the, the patterns of denning between brown and polar bears uh, is a, a, also a significant contrast, Alisa, because in any given year, most polar bears do not enter a den. But somebody was wondering, we did get an audience, a couple of audience questions about this. Uh, do polar bears hibernate or why don't they hibernate like brown bears? Right. Yeah, they're, you know, these bears are just on opposite schedules. It's like brown bears are on day shift and polar bears are on <laughs> night shift or something. They're just doing things differently. Yeah, the winter is the abundance time for polar bears, so they can't hibernate. It, it's when they need to go hunting. So we don't see polar bears hibernate. The only bears, the only polar bears that do go into a den are pregnant females. And they will go into a den. Well, they're in the dens right now. They would have been going in as the fall hit, late summer. Uh, polar bears have what we call delayed implantation. So they would have mated last spring, this last spring, um, and then, you know, tried to eat as much as they could in the spring, which is the real time of abundance for polar bear when all the seals are pupping. They'll come back to land in this area in the summer. And if they still have enough body fat and they're healthy enough, then they'll go into the den right now. And then we'll see them continue uh, to stay in the den, not technically hibernating, but the mother's body does slow down a little bit. And then those uh, new families will emerge in the spring. Well, in March, maybe early March, maybe late February. It kind of depends on the area of the Arctic you're looking in. Um, and their dens also vary depending on the area of the Arctic you're looking in. So some polar bears do den on the ice, on the sea ice, and might live on the sea ice all year round. In other areas like Hudson Bay and Churchill, uh, these polar bears might and do take more advantage of the soil, the permafrost, and especially along riverbanks. And they might even use dens that have been used before. So we know there's areas of Wapas National Park, which is a very famous denning area for polar bears. And there's areas where there's polar bear dens year round. You can go see them uh, when there's no polar bears in them. And then the bears will reuse those dens again and again um, throughout their lives. So right now we're seeing moms head into the dens. They're probably hanging out there right now. And then they're gonna give birth around December or so. And we assign every polar bear cub a birthday of January 1st, just to keep it easy on ourselves. And I did want to mention quickly too, I believe that uh, NASA scientists have actually looked at bears hibernating and taking clues from that as to how we can reduce um, astronauts losing so much muscle mass when they're up in space. Because like you said, the bears are you know staying pretty healthy with this long period of inactivity. So bears might have some clues for us in that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it could help us to travel to you know distant planets um, if we can kind of slow down our metabolism mm -hmm. and keep our bones healthy. Yeah. 
uh, and our muscles healthy at the same time because yeah, they're not exercising yet. They figure out a way to do it. Uh, their kidney, their organs stay healthy as well. Like their kidneys, they basically brown bears mm-hmm. basically shut off their kidneys when they're hibernating. Um, but then they can turn them back on and everything's a okay when they come out of the den. It's really kind of amazing what they can do. And we can figure that out. I think we can help um, a lot of people, not only astronauts, but people here on earth who are maybe suffering mm. from um, illnesses related to, uh, you know, bed rest or organ failure. Uh, I, so something to look forward to certainly in the future. And for me too, it's mm-hmm. always really fascinating to consider how brown bears are not obligate hibernators that means they don't have to hibernate to survive winter if the right conditions exist most of them are going to hibernate uh, it, because there's just not food available for them in the winter time and uh, so that's really what they're doing when they're going into the dens they're not so much avoiding cold it's really that they're avoiding famine at that time of the year they usually can't find enough food during winter to remain active but in some places they can find enough food or at least the combination of milder weather, milder weather, excuse me, and uh, some food that can keep them active. This hasn't been documented with Katmai National Park's brown bears, although biologists have documented winter active brown bears on nearby Kodiak Island. And that's shoved a little bit farther out into the Pacific Ocean. The temperature is even more, uh, or excuse me, the, the climate is even more mild out on Kodiak Island. So every year there's like a few bears that are active year round, even though they can be kind of sluggish, they're not at their full activity level. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think uh, of the the denning behaviors and physiologies uh, and those differences between brown and polar bears, this is a good example of like, uh, of inherited traits being leveraged by a species as it evolves and adapts. And we'll talk more about the evolution and genetic relatedness of brown and polar bears in a few moments. Uh, But in short, fossil and genetic evidence indicates that polar bears are descended from brown bears. So I, again, this is just me spitballing here, but when polar bears evolved, they, maybe they exploited the ability to uh, from their brown bear a- ancestors to remain active year round because they found access to year round food by hunting seals on sea ice. Uh, but they, maybe they haven't been able to shed the need to use dens as birthing places like their brown bear ancestors. And, and that remains a shared characteristic between uh, the two species. Uh, and I think also family life is is a fascinating aspect of uh, their biology and their behavior as well. Brown bears, you mentioned, Elisa, they give birth um, in, in dens, or excuse me, polar bears give birth in dens like, uh, like brown bears. Uh, so what happens afterwards? So let's say mother gives birth in the den, she nurses their, her cubs for a while, they come out of the den. Uh, what's their family like? family life like outside of the den and how long do polar bear mothers and families uh, stay together? Right. Uh, They stay together for about two and a half years from when the cubs are born. So when the family emerges from their dens, it's of course a really vulnerable time for families and moms and cubs, you know, when we talk about populations declining, it's not that we are seeing these massive starvation events and all these adults are dying off. It's really that it's getting harder to have these cubs. So it's quite a special time in a polar bear's life. And there's a lot of pressure on these moms and the moms in the Churchill area. If you imagine that they've come off ice in the summer, gone into their den, given birth, nursed their cubs, and now they're coming out of the den in March, they've gone about eight months without eating, which is wild. So basically what happens is the mom decides one day, we're not really sure how, if it's temperature or light or, her cubs just are driving her crazy Um, but she breaks out of the den and she gives a little bit of time to her cubs so they usually hang out at the den for a few days maybe a week and the cubs get used to their legs and they get a little bit of exercise and they get a little bit of strength and then when the mom decides they're ready she will head to the sea ice on hudson bay i'm talking very churchill specific here now this Mm -hmm. travel it can be you know tens of kilometers if not maybe 100 kilometers to the ice so they really do have a bit of a trek They'll usually get there within a week or so. There's a lot of, you know, give and take here. Um, But she's got to go on a little bit of a journey with her cubs and then get to the ice. And then, you know, mama's hungry. (laughs) So they've timed this emergence with the seal pupping season. So this is right around when seals are giving birth. There's these little seal pups that are pretty naive, but very fatty out on the sea ice and they're easier hunting. And so the families can fatten up pretty quick. The cubs are learning everything they can from their mom. The mom will often have two, though singles are becoming a bit more common and occasionally we'll see triplets. So it's getting a little bit more rare. And so she's got to, you know, keep her cubs navigating the ice, teach them how to 
basically live on now a moving platform. I mean, being on the sea ice is wild. It's something it's always moving. It's still kind of dark. It's windy. You're looking for seals. It's a lot. These cubs have two and a half years to learn from mom. So the first year, they're probably a bit of a burden. Mom's nursing them. Polar bears have the fattest milk we find on land, the fattiest. So it's almost like whipping cream. So the cubs are growing very quick. In the second year of their life, they're called yearlings. And there may be a little bit more help. And then in the third year of their life, they're with their mom for a few months, hopefully being a little more helpful with hunting. And then they're weaned because mom's going to mate again. And that period from when they're weaned to when they're adults is about two and a half years. They're called sub-adults at that time. They're kind of like the teenagers of the bear world. And that is a tough time for a polar bear because they're not, you know, at their peak of intelligence yet. They're taking risks. They're hungry. They're not fully grown. It's harder to catch a seal. And it's also a vulnerable time for them. Um, so really when we, we look at polar bear survival overall, we're looking at from the time of denning to when they're five. If a polar bear can make it to five, it's doing pretty well. And, and so that's where we're focusing a lot of our research um, and our efforts at Polar Bears International is with some denning and protecting dens and moms and cubs. So they're, they're just so important and cute. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that, uh, that sort of tracks that sub adult stage tracks with what uh, brown bears experience it's a it's a difficult mm -hmm. time for them but maybe one of the differences is uh that if if you're like a, a sub adult brown bear at brooks river and you can't get access to like the best fishing spots you can go eat some vegetation or some berries like you mm -hmm. have that alternative mm -hmm. right you know you're out on the sea ice alone maybe with a as a polar bear you don't have that that ability and, and the smaller uh, you are as a brown bear, the more easily you can make a living off of vegetation. Uh, so some some small bears mm -hmm. actually can gain weight um, by just feeding mostly on herbaceous plants during the spring. There's like enough protein in that and sugars in that where they can they can gain body mass on that. Um, so, you know, again, that's maybe one of the differences between brown and polar bears is they, uh, you know, is the diversity in diet. Um, before I talk a little bit more about brown bears, uh, cubs and families though, Elisa, I wanted to give you a chance to answer an audience question that came in because somebody was wondering how many cubs do they average? I can't remember if you mentioned that or not, but what's their average litter size? Yeah, average tends to be about two. Um, in some areas we're seeing two a little less often and more singles. And then Hudson Bay used to be kind of famous for triplets, though we're seeing fewer triplets these days, but we might expect a mom to have one or two most of the time. And I think you brought up a great point about how it's not necessarily uh, when 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 populations are having a hard time, you know, reproducing and, and surviving, it's not that you're going to see like a bunch of starving bears out on the landscape. It's going to be like mm -hmm. just fewer families, uh, you know, fewer cubs, yeah. fewer cubs surviving. And that's the same thing in areas where brown bears are relying on salmon, too. If there's a, a year where there's not a lot of salmon coming back to that area, the big the big adult males, they're going to be pretty, pretty much, you know, they're going to do okay. Uh, they're going to be able to dominate access to the best fishing spots. They're still going to be able to gain, you know, most of the body fat that they need. It's really the mothers with first year cubs that are really in um, a, a more difficult position. And in brown bear cubs, mm -hmm. uh, just to contrast those with polar bears, they'll keep their cubs uh, for about the same amount of time. And it depends on where you are in the world, but one to three summers, on average, although the average age of cubs uh, at family breakup um, in Katmai, that's usually uh, at the beginning of a cub's third or fourth summer. So uh, a mother bear will keep her cub in Katmai for two or three summers. The family will den together for another whole winter, and then they'll separate in the spring during the mating season. So the, the life mm -hmm. of a cub with mom is a short apprenticeship. They have to learn a lot about how to live and where to find food and what to eat. And I wonder if that final separation is a bit shocking for a young bear who has relied on its mother, you know, so much for guidance and food and protection. It is a very uh, important and significant event um, in their, their lives. Uh, and we get, of course, um, as we're, we're getting closer towards the end of our conservation or conversation today, I do want to talk about uh, bear conservation and, um, but I think there's really one interesting aspect of the the shared uh, history of brown and polar bears as we're comparing and contrasting them, Elisa, and that's like how closely related they actually are. And that's a question that I, I know that you get frequently, and we kind of and I know uh, talking to people on the brown bear cams in Katmai, we get that question a lot too. So uh, can you 
talk to us a little bit more about how closely related brown and polar bears are? Right. I think you'd mentioned earlier that we know polar bears split off from the brown bear maybe about 150,000 years ago. We don't have like rock solid um, amount of time yet, but that's kind of our guess. And we think that it likely maybe happened up in Alaska that the grizzly bears, brown bears up there, that some of them with the lighter color morphs were able to, you know, blend in with the ice, figure out ways to hunt seals, and eventually we ended up with the polar bear, which is pretty cool. So they they seem so different, but they're so closely related that they can actually interbreed with each other. And we've seen this happen. It's probably always happened to some extent sparsely. Um, the most recent situations that we know of was about 10 years ago, um, there was a female polar bear up in the high Arctic in Canada. And we know through genetic evidence that at two separate times of her life, she mated with two different brown bear males had hybrid cubs who were half and half. And then some of those hybrid cubs mated with the same brown bear males and had three quarter brown, one quarter polar bear cubs. And so we know that they can breed. Now, some of you may be thinking, and I get this question a lot, well, wouldn't this be maybe like the new super bear? Like, would this hybrid take over? They can breed. Um, it's this mix of these two really great bears up in the Arctic. And that, no, <laughs> it didn't work out very well. So we've <laughs> talked today about these differences and how these different bears are so well adapted to different ecosystems that when you mix them together, you have this bear that just doesn't really fit anywhere. And so these growler bears anecdotally were quite aggressive, just based on anecdotes there, um, but their coloring was kind of off, their claws and feet were kind of off and not really well suited. Um, so it's just not a bear we're gonna see take over the world. Uh, we likely will see it happen again in the wild uh, to some extent, and maybe even slightly more common as these bears overlap increasingly, but we don't expect to see a lot of gorilla bears out there at any given time, but it sure is interesting and a good example of how closely related they are. Yeah, we did get an audience question about that. Uh, I think one of the first ones that came in during our live chat today, somebody was wondering, is it ever possible for polar bears and brown bears to cross paths? So you gave that example of like a rare event of, of a hybridization between them. Um, but you're, uh, if, if maybe you could talk about like the Churchill region, because it's uh, from what I've read recently, uh, grizzly bears, which are again are, are brown bears, just a different name for the same animal. They've moved mm -hmm. sort of into the, the the Churchill region. So, has there been any documented um, observations of encounters between the bears in the, in that habitat? There have been. So, yeah, historically they didn't really see grizzly bears there, and now Churchill has documented black bears, brown bears, and polar bears. So, a pretty special spot to be. Um, the stories I've heard are generally, yeah, the bears interacting. Grizzly bears can be very generalized, but the most aggressive often. Um, they've got a bit more attitude. The polar bears, particularly in the summer. So polar bears, again, they don't have hibernation. Their body doesn't change at all in the summer, but they really need to conserve their energy. And they're just probably not going to go up against a grizzly bear if they could. So I think the bears generally like to avoid each other unless they were seeing one another as prey, which could happen if there was a really small bear coming up against the bigger bear. Um, but yeah, it sure is an interesting region to look at and i know people have seen some pretty neat sites out there with all the different bears there are it is really special to have three species of of north american bears all in the same area i'm not actually mm -hmm. sure if that happens anywhere else except for like in that that area of churchill what pest national park yeah really cool to to know that um and it, with, with one thing that you mentioned too, Elise, so just watching um, brown bears in person at Katmai, and we can see this on the cameras too, like attitude means so much in the, the hierarchy where they're trying to establish, you know, access to the best fishing spots at Brooks Falls. So even sometimes if you're a smaller body bear, you can punch above your weight, so to speak, and you can, <laughs> you know, kind of shove other bears out of the way. The bear that I have on, on my screen behind me, Grazer, she's a female brown bear. She's famous for that at Brooks River she uh, is super tough she is maybe the the toughest uh, female bear that i've ever seen and she sometimes will punish male brown bears who get too close to her uh, and that's putting it mildly so yeah uh, I, I could see how like uh, if there's a big brown, uh, you know polar bear on the landscape but there's a a, a, a brown bear or a grizzly bear that just has the attitude that a, a polar bear be like you know what you are not worth it dude and i'm just gonna leave. yeah leave you be. Uh, but I, th I think this is a great way to transition into like, um, you know, some notes and, and um, the discussion about bear conservation, because as 
uh, as the climate continues to warm, uh, polar bears are going to be spending more time on land uh, because you know sea ice is going to decline and has been declining over the last several decades. So that could put them in a in a place where they're going to encounter you know uh, brown bears more often. And this year, sea ice. Uh, I was looking at some stats just the other day. Um, it was once again well below twentieth century averages. In fact, I read that the global sea ice extent uh, in September twenty twenty three was the lowest on record primarily because of sea ice loss in the southern hemisphere around Antarctica. So it was a really bad year for sea ice around Antarctica. In the northern hemisphere where polar bears reside, uh, Arctic sea ice extent was the fifth lowest since 2006. And that's important to note too, because across uh, 45 years of satellite data I was reading, and that starts in 1979, the 17 smallest Arctic sea ice extents have occurred during the past 17 years. So we are on this long, a uh, slow but continuous downward tread in the extent of sea ice. Uh, so how does a reduced sea ice cover affect uh, polar bears? Yeah, it affects them pretty directly. So you can imagine, it's not the most perfect analogy, but the sea ice really is like the dinner plate for polar bears. You take that away and they're not eating much, they're not getting the calories they need. Polar bears hunt seals, like I've mentioned, but they really do need to use that sea ice to get to the seals. Seals can outswim polar bears in the open water. A polar bear can potentially catch a seal on land rarely if the seal has really messed up that day, having a bad day. Um, but ultimately, polar bears use the sea ice to help them stalk seals. Um, they wait by seal holes in the ice really quietly and patiently for the seal to come up for air. They need to use the ice to their advantage. So when you start taking the ice away from polar bears, you start taking calories away from them and the blubber that they rely on. And so in places where we have seen significant sea ice loss already, we have seen a decline in the number of polar bears. And again, it's not that all the bears have starved to death, it's that it's been harder for moms to reach the base weight that they need to give birth successfully to cubs and then raise those cubs up into adulthood. There's a recent paper we'll be talking about this fall as well that looked at the impacts of lactation on how long polar bears have to fast for without that ice. Basically, no ice means fasting. So in Western Hudson Bay, the Churchill bears we're looking at on the cam, they've declined about 50% since the 80s. We had about 1,200 polar bears in this region in the 1980s, and now we have just over 600. And that is related to the loss of sea ice in the area. This year, these polar bears were on land earlier than usual, about mid-June. And that was reflected in the number of handlings that the local polar bear alert conservation team had. So polar bear alert was moving a lot of bears out of town in the summer. Um, the bears were just sticking around more. They didn't get quite as much time as they wanted on that sea ice to hunt seals. So we'll see what the fall looks like. The bears are probably all ready to eat. Uh, temperatures are starting to cool down, which is the good news for this year. But of course, long-term trends has us concerned about the future of polar bears in this region. And we like to also call these polar bears, the fat white hairy canaries in the coal mine. This is the best studied group of polar bears in the world. They've taught us a ton about what polar bears need, how they're impacted by different things. And so what we're seeing in this population, we can apply to other populations and other parts of the Arctic and kind of see what's coming for them and help us plan better to keep those polar bears in the wild. And does, uh, does that, any of that affect maybe like the size of a cub at birth? Um, somebody was wondering how much does a cub weigh at birth? I know with brown bears, it's about one pound on average. Is there a difference maybe um, in the in the birth size, depending on how well fed a, a mother bear is, but it seems like maybe there just needs to be like that fat threshold that they have to reach before they can reproduce. So maybe there isn't a difference. Right. Yeah. So we think uh, so far we think polar bear moms have to be about four hundred and twenty pounds to get pregnant. When polar bear cubs are born, well, I'll be honest with you, we're not often or ever there when wild polar bear cubs are born. <laughs> we know from the zoos that they are also born at about a pound, so like a good chunk of butter sort of thing. Um, we do see though, with the studies that have looked at polar bear moms and cubs that have emerged. So when the cubs are about three to four months old, sometimes there's studies in some areas. And we know from data looking at those cubs that by that time, just a few months old, sometimes you can see stark differences in body size. So if you have triplets, you're likely to have a runt out of the three. Who might not make it. Um, male cubs can be a bit bigger than female cubs. But yeah, ultimately, like hopefully the mom has been in a certain weight, she can lactate, get them to a certain size, and then get to the ice. And then things probably really vary by there, depending on how successful they are at that first hunt and beyond. 
then when uh, sea ice was more extensive 30 to 40 years ago, were there polar bears who lived their whole entire lives out on the ice? You, uh, you know, we, when we're talking about the Hudson Bay population, it seems like they, they're forced to come to shore. But what about the rest of the Arctic? Because they were, you know, they're, they're not restricted, of course, to Hudson Bay. They live, you know, across the entire Arctic landscape. Yeah, great point. So polar bears do live in Canada, which has two thirds of the world's population, also Alaska, Norway, Greenland, and Russia. And there are four different types of ecoregions we split them into. So there's the seasonal, which we are looking at in Churchill, and there's also divergent, convergent archipelago. I don't need to go into depth on all of those, but let's suffice to say that yes, some polar bears do spend their whole lives on the Arctic sea ice. It's likely that more of those bears will now have to choose land or ice. Uh, we've seen that in the Beaufort Sea in Alaska. It used to be that almost all of those bears would spend the entire year out on the ice. And now more of the polar bears are choosing to have to spend the summers on land because the ice is just so far out. Um, so yes, some polar bears live their whole lives on ice and some have to make tough choices and others like the Hudson Bay bears always come to land in the summer. So there is a good amount of variation depending on where we look. It also seems like from what I've read, there's a, there's a difference in the types of sea ice, particularly like when you think about the mm -hmm. age of sea ice. Uh, so some sea ice can be more than a year old. Uh, does the overall decline in older sea ice, um, affect polar bears versus like the, the fresh sea ice that they're going to walk out onto from, from the Churchill area, that stuff that's just been frozen for a few weeks. Right. Yeah. It's such a good question because this gets into some real complexities of ecology and the ecosystem, which we could have a whole other webcast or 10 about that. Um, when we start to lose this multi-year Arctic sea ice, it, it's a bad thing for the ecosystem. There's a lot of um, plants and organisms that can grow within the ice itself and that multi-year sea ice is so stable and it's helping you know reflect sunlight away from the earth so we really do want to keep multi-year sea ice sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest and that ice is the base of the food chain um, as is the annual ice but it's interesting because in the short term when we see multi-year ice be lost and replaced with annual ice that will come back and melt every year and come back and melt. Um, there could be short term benefits for polar bears because that thinner ice is a little bit easier to hunt seals through that thinner ice seals will make air holes in that ice now, whereas maybe they couldn't through the very thick multi year ice uh, polar bears can use it a bit more for finding their prey. Um, so we could see the short term benefits of polar bears using now this fresher ice to hunt a little bit more. But we know that part of the progression of that is that that will eventually be lost too. So it's no solution to the problem of losing Arctic sea ice. And we really, all of us, bears, people around the world, we really do rely on Arctic sea ice as like Earth's air conditioner to keep us cool. So it's really important that we are changing our fuel systems to cleaner energy so that we're keeping that Arctic sea ice in the Arctic. You touched on this a little bit ago during the program, uh, but maybe uh, you talk about it again too, because I know it's something that people wonder, uh, you know, if, if polar bears are spending more time on land, could they adapt to eat more terrestrial foods, things like berries or, or some other food that they find on land? Such a great question. And it's one that researchers have spent a lot of time on because we had the same question. So there's been some very in-depth research on polar bears, their energetics, their dietary needs, caloric needs. And again, polar bears do eat berries and eggs and whatever they can find their bears. So why isn't this enough? Well, it turns out that polar bears have no sort of hibernation system. We used to think that they maybe did slow their metabolism down in the summer, but they don't. And in fact, when we researched their metabolism, found out that it's a lot higher than we even estimated. So they have massive energetic needs. And one of the most, if not the most calorically rich food in the world is blubber. And that's why they're going after this blubber, both for the fat and the calories. There is no food on land, none, that has near enough calories to sustain a polar bear long-term. Their bodies require ridiculous amounts. And again, they're not, they have genetic differences between their digestive system and the brown bear's digestive system. So actual genetic differences in how they process food. So if you're giving them a lot of that roughage, the berries, um, even the proteins, these carbohydrates, the bear is not going to be as healthy over time as a brown bear would. Brown bear would be fine, but polar bears not so much. So we know that long-term they cannot spend extended periods of time on land. They will start to starve and females are impacted 
uh, with their lactation. So they might lose the milk that they're feeding their babies or it gets a lot less fatty. And the farther that we force them to be on land, the harder it is on them and the more likely they are to come into contact with people, which isn't good for either species. So we really do need to see polar bears out on that Arctic sea ice. And yeah, it's, I, I think it's a great point to think about like the types of foods that are available to different bears because it's, it's not all foods are equal. Um, with, right. with brown bears, especially it's, it's, uh, they like protein, right? But fat, it's fat and sugar is where it's at for them. They are really oh, good yeah. at digesting fat, but they're also mm -hmm. really great at, at digesting sugar. And that's like the mm -hmm. ultimate brown bear diet. So, and that's why brown bears in Katmai National Park are so lucky in a sense. And also those on, that are living on nearby Kodiak Island, and they grow into some of the largest bears in the world because they have access, mm -hmm. the, not, only, not only to abundant food, but they have access to fatty foods like salmon and uh, salmon is also high in protein and then also sugary foods like berries. So they have like all of the, the essential nutrients that they need easily accessible to them. And you can think about how difficult that might be for bears that are, aren't, you know, as well adapted to live as a generalist omnivore. They just don't have, you know, those options. And it's not like they can flip a switch and say, you know what, I'm just going to start eating plants now. It wouldn't, it wouldn't right. work for them. Their body yeah. just can't adapt uh, to that um that those the to, to processing those foods as well that's like a long long evolutionary uh process for them um so getting down to like you know we're getting close to the end of our, our broadcast today uh at least it's been really fun to talk with you but um i want to know like how fast have the impacts of climate change come for the arctic region it's maybe something that's it's a little bit harder to see I think in Katmai, the fingers of climate change are definitely there. They're certainly impacting the Katmai region. And I can expand on that in just a little bit, but I wanted to ask you first about sort of like the Arctic and especially the Western Hudson Bay area first. Right. You know, I mentioned that polar bears, we had more polar bears in the Churchill region in the 1980s, which, you know, 30 to 40 years ago. And that might sound like a long time to a human potentially, but in the scheme of geographic time, that is less than a blink of an eye. So things are happening extremely quickly. And polar bears, they're a long lived mammal that reproduces slowly. And so when you have that sort of reproduction method and now you're seeing these changes really quickly, it's harder and harder to successfully reproduce. You know, you're, and you're teaching your cubs one thing when they're little, okay, here's how you navigate the patterns. And then by the time those cubs are just a few years older, things can be starkly different. So it is changing really quickly. It's changing too fast. Uh, we're seeing some rapid developments in certain parts of the Arctic. And so that's why we are encouraging people to act now. We're, we're getting deeper into policy asks, pushing governments to do real things for climate change. So one of the great things that Polar Bears International has been able to do this year is our um, chief scientist emeritus, Steve Amstrup, he published a paper being able to directly link fossil fuel emissions with sea ice and polar bear survival and we were able to take that to the u.s government and under the marine mammal act we'll actually get them to do something hopefully so that's really great we are pushing um as much as we can and trying to get everyone on board because again at the end of the day we all love polar bears and want to protect their future but really it's about protecting our future and the super cool thing is that anything we can do for polar bears in terms of reducing fossil fuel emissions and moving to more solar and wind energy it's all good for ourselves and our children and our own future generations so we do really need to act right now yeah we, we certainly do i couldn't agree more uh, when we look at brown bears too they're they're well positioned as a species to endure rapid changes because of their dietary flexibility but that doesn't mean individual brown bears won't suffer it doesn't mean that populations of brown bears won't decline or suffer uh, and some of the things that we love about brown bears are likely to be negatively impacted as well uh, for example like heat waves could disrupt salmon runs you know that could happen at brooks river it's happened uh, a few years ago uh, climate change is also good to exert and, and is exerting a strong influence on the oceans uh, through ocean acidification, which can disrupt the marine food webs. Uh, salmon are uh, a, a species like polar bears. They are adapted to cold conditions. They Salmon love cold water. So even a few degrees in temperatures uh, can make a difference for a salmon. And out in the ocean is where salmon gain most of their body mass. So if the oceans 
are less productive for salmon, whether that's water temperatures or like uh, availability of food, then that's going to have a ripple effect on um, not only ocean ecosystems, but terrestrial ecosystems where the salmon come back to spawn. So uh, there's the, those aspects of it. There's also um, droughts that can impact like berry abundance or other foods. And then maybe people moving from some areas where the climate is getting a little too harsh, they're moving into areas where brown bears live and that can fragment habitat uh, for, for bears in need. Um, I, I, you know, at least I did have one final question for you, and it, and it is, it's of course related to climate change, um, and it's a serious issue, and it's something that I struggle with a lot because I feel, to be honest with everybody, I feel quite a bit of climate anxiety um, on a weekly basis, and sometimes often on a daily basis, depending on what I'm reading or thinking about, uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty and worry regarding climate change, and not just for bears but for people as well. Uh, so, at least I'm wondering, you know. Uh, you know, what gives you hope and motivation as, you know, we're looking, we're looking forward in, the, in time? Yeah, it's um, a mix. Uh, I get to speak to kids quite often and young students or older students. And I really am so impressed by the future generation that is coming up um, and how dedicated they are and how mad they are and willing to do something about it. And they are just giving me so much like buoyancy to this work, you know, so kind of doing it for them and letting them energize me. But also uh, speaking to people, I really think we've come to the point where most are concerned about our future and are seeing changes and are having a better idea of what's going on and are more willing to vote with the climate in mind and our future in mind. And I think one of the best antidotes to anxiety is action. And so the more we can all do as a community working together, the better the better we're going to end up you know it's not about oh you got to recycle that can or turn off your lights it's about let's mobilize what kind of energy is being offered to us what are our politicians doing for us what do we need and just being able to talk about it with one another more freely and pushing that forward i think is really important and it keeps me going my colleagues and all the folks i get to talk to and then just seeing the bears honestly just chilling and watching the bear cams brown bear cams or polar bear cams it's like Oh yeah, we want to keep that around for a long time, you know. So we'll work on it. Yeah, I, and when I'm, you know, kind of feeling some of those emotions as well, tuning into animals, whether if I'm lucky enough to take a walk in the woods, um, or or turn on the turn on the the wildlife cams on Explore.org, whether that's brown bears, polar yeah. bears, or something else, that does help to. I can I can feel the stress levels kind of dip in those situations. So sharing mm -hmm. that experience with everybody, I think, is a is a great point. Um, and working towards a better future with with policies as well as, as much as we can. Uh, and I encourage everyone to share the, the webcams with as many people as you can. Uh, Lisa, uh, what, do, what can we expect to see on the polar bear cams and especially as buggy one is traveling around the tundra this fall? Right. Well, every year is a little bit different, but I'll guarantee you'll see some sort of polar bear action. So the bears are coming in. They're starting to gather. The temperatures are dropping, so we'll see more coming in. You might see some sparring, which is the bears playing. You'll see a lot of bears sleeping. Hopefully, you'll see some moms and cubs this year and some foxes as well and cool birds. There's all sorts of stuff that we hope to see in the next few weeks. And the cams will be running until the bears are gone. So every year is a little different. Uh, but we'll be there every step of the way to answer questions and give some context and find some polar bears. And if you want to learn more about uh, bears or watch the bears available on Explore.org, there's a couple different websites to go to. You can go to Explore.org slash bears for the brown bears at Katmai National Park. Again, there's still some fishing for salmon right now, so check it out. Pretty short uh, season for them. Uh, they're going to be denning very soon, but check that out. And then also, if you want to watch the polar bears, again, the first polar bears that we've seen on the cameras are, were showed up today. So you can find them at explore.org slash polar bears. You can also find links to uh, the cams, the polar bear cams, and a, a ton of great information about polar bears and how you can help them at polarbearsinternational.org. That's usually my first <laughs> stop when I have a polar bear question. Do they have it on polarbearsinternational.org? That's usually where I go uh, first. Uh, brown bears and polar bears are, are two closely related species. Uh, they use specialized adaptations uh, to survive different ecosystems, but their lifestyles raise questions about their future in an era of human-driven climate change. Polar bears and brown bears are driven by a profound hunger. I think that's one of the themes that you can take away from our, our discussion today. 
They build body fat to fuel their survival during times of prolonged famine. And that body fat provides female bears with the energy they need to feed their cubs when no food is available. They're intelligent, they're individualistic, they're tough, they're resilient. And these two bear species and uh, their differences between them, whether you're talking about brown bears in Katmai or in Western Hudson Bay in Manitoba, they show a stark contrast in the lifestyles and adaptations uh, bet between them. Uh, and it also, again, serves as a poignant reminder of the impacts of humans on these animals. And it's been a really fun discussion uh, with you, Elisa. Again, I learned a lot about polar bears. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to share your expertise and, and happy polar bear season. Happy polar bears. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate this as always and everything that you're doing. And my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. My co-host for our broadcast today was Elisa McCall from Polar Bears International. Enjoy the, the polar bear and the brown bear cams. And until we talk to you again, as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. A polar bear's life cycle is almost exclusively tied to the sea ice. Because polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt, to breed, and sometimes to den, sea ice loss from climate change is their biggest threat, and the reason the bears are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. What we learn about climate change impacts on polar bears in Hudson Bay can be applied across the Arctic to help conserve other populations. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. When Arctic waters are cold enough, the top layer freezes into a special type of ice called sea ice. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. It supports the entire Arctic food chain. 